The public confrontation of Hiss and Chambers began at 10.30 in the morning on Wednesday, August 25, 1948, in the caucus room of the Old House Building in Washington. Several hours of it were broadcast on local television. I think it was the first House hearing in Washington that was ever televised. The committee's chairman, J. Parnell Thomas of New Jersey, presided. He was just about to go to prison, by the way. But Nixon asked most of the questions. And it began with a bit of stage business that Stripling set up, just to clarify for the audience or newcomers what was going to be talked about today. Uh, Hiss and Chambers were a couple of feet from each other. He had them stand up. They swore to tell the truth. Each of them said who he was. And then he asked each of them, do you know this man, and when did you last see him? And each of them answered. Chambers said, I knew Alger Hiss, last saw him in 37, or now he says early 38. And then Hiss says, I identify this man as the man I knew as George Crosley, and that's so on. Hiss was questioned and testified first. He was on the spot for about six hours. God knows what you could get me to say if I were under oath on television for six hours. The focus of the questions was whether Hiss and Chambers had known each other for a long time as friends from 34 to 38. As Chambers claimed, or for a short time as tenant and deadbeat subtenant, mainly in 34 and 35, as Hiss claimed. Now, by now, Hiss has become achingly careful in his wording and cautious. Uh, by one count, he began his answers to, the, to questions with the words, to the best of my recollection, about 10 times. Pardon me, about 200 times. While, he was, while Hiss was talking, Chambers sometimes looked at the ceiling. Hiss made no attempt to hide his disdain for HUAC. And as each part of his George Crosley story was, was weakened by evidence, Hiss retreated and hedged so that by the end of his testimony, there was very little of the story that was left. He seemed to be saying that sometime in the mid-1930s, he'd known this guy with really bad teeth. He could not explain his Hamlet-like hesitation in recognizing Chambers. He was a man who left a vivid impression on people who met him only for a few minutes. Um, when he was shown three pictures of Chambers, and Chambers is sitting a few feet away, Hiss not only refused to say whether they were pictures of Chambers or Crosley, he refused to say whether they were pictures of the same man. He was asked about all the people he'd known and worked with in the AAA who were known by 1948 to be communists or party members, and when asked if they were ever or had been party members, had all taken the Fifth Amendment. And he, they, they asked him, how could you have known these people? And all these communists and said to us in your first testimony that as far as you knew, you had never known a communist. And Hiss said, well, that's not precisely what I testified. I merely testified that to the best of my knowledge, none of my friends is a communist. And correct, but hyper-technical. Uh, HUAC staff had done a lot of looking through what are called the regularly kept records of disinterested third parties records that are kept by businesses and governments and are therefore likely to be reliable and by, kept by people and governments who have no reason to favor one side or the other in the present dispute. And all this evidence turned out, tended to disprove the George Crosley story. First, there was no written lease or sublease between Hiss and Chambers, perhaps hard to believe for a careful lawyer like Hiss. And the records of various real estate companies and public utilities showed that Hiss's 28th Street apartment was vacant for only two months, May and June of 35, not three or four, as he'd said. This was also sooner than Hiss had implied. He said that it had been during the summer of 35. No one had been found who knew Chambers or anyone else as George Crosley in the 28th Street apartment building or on Capitol Hill in 1935. And you'd think that if Hiss had been posing to Cham if Chambers had been posing to Hiss as George Crosley, he would have been doing that to other people. Nor had anyone named George Crosley published any articles in Washington in those years. But the most damaging evidence to Hiss was about the cars, and it was in the form of uh, records of a car dealership and the D.C. Department of Motor Vehicles. This gets a little complicated, but Hiss had said that he had two cars. I had the new middle-class Plymouth we'd just bought and the old Ford with the sassy little trunk and the hand-operated windshield wipers, and we gave Crosley the Ford in connection with the sublease. But the DMV records showed that Hiss didn't buy the Plymouth until September 1935, months after the alleged sublease had come to an end. So if Hiss's story was true, that he gave Crosley the car as part of the sublease, he gave Crosley his only car. If this were true, it seemed to support his chamber story that Hiss was a fanatical anti-communist.
you'd have to be one to give a to give chamber or to give someone your only car. And Hiss said, well, okay, look, this was so many years ago. We have two transactions here, the sublease and the car. Uh, maybe I got the two transactions wrong by combining them in my mind. It was so long ago. Maybe I gave Crosley the car a few months later after the sublease. And he said, okay. That means that first you figured out he was a deadbeat, and then you gave him a car. That makes even less sense. More fundamentally, the car story seemed incredible, even if you accept Hiss's sequence of events. Hiss, a man with no family money and three mouths to feed on the salary of a junior government lawyer during the Great Depression, gave away a car? And Hiss said, well, maybe I didn't give him the car. I may have just given him the use of the car. And Nixon said, this is a direct quote, did you give Crosley a car? And Hiss said, I gave Crosley according to my best recollection, and Nixon says, well, now just a moment on that point. I don't want to interrupt you, uh, but certainly you can testify yes or no as to whether you gave Crosley a car. How many cars have you given away in your life, Mr. Hiss? At that, the audience laughed at Hiss, the first of several times they did that. And Hiss said, well, the car had great sentimental value to me and my wife, and I don't recall anything about the formal transfer of the car. I gave it to Crosley because it was so old and dilapidated as to be worthless. And for God's sake, we're talking about something that happened 15 years ago. <sighs> Even with all the sympathy you might give somebody for that passage of time, it seemed very self-contradictory. If the car had great value to him, would you give it to a deadbeat, someone you didn't like? Wouldn't you want it disposed of carefully? Um, wouldn't you remember about its disposition? And cars were not worthless. In, 19, uh, in the mid-30s, even 1929 Fords had a resale value of about $60, which in those days was more than a month's wages at the minimum wage. And assuming you merely loaned it to Crosley, would you let someone who you knew was irresponsible drive your car around town and maybe get into an accident for, what, for which you might be held legally liable? And surely you, a Harvard-trained lawyer, would know about that. But most damaging to Hiss, were records showing what actually happened to the Ford. You may recall that Hiss said he gave the car to Crosley as part of the sublease, and Chambers said Hiss gave the car to the communist movement. The records showed that what happened to the car was very strange. On July 23, 1936, Hiss gave the car to a car dealership, the Churner Motor Company. He received no money. I've never heard of anybody giving a car to a used car dealership. Second, the records of the Turner Company showed that on the same day, the car was sold to a Mr. William Rosen with a $25 mortgage. And Mr. Rosen, when called before HUAC, refused to say, on the grounds of the Fifth Amendment, whether he, had, he was or ever had been a member of the Communist Party, and he refused to say anything about the Ford. And the address of Mr. Rosen stated on the car documents was a false one. Now, both Hiss's gift and the later transfer to Rosen was... Uh, was made by the people of and on the facilities of the Churner Motor Company, but that car was never recorded as a car owned by the Churner Motor Company on the books of the Churner Motor Company. In other words, it, it looked like a sort of off-the-books transaction, not the normal above-board practices of Churner Motors. The papers transferring the car from Hiss to Churner bore Hiss's signature, which were notarized by the notary public where Hiss worked at the time, which is the Justice Department. And all this is consistent with Chambers' story that somehow unknown to him, the car had been given to the communist movement. And that Chambers knew what happened to the car was consistent with his story that he was still conversant with Hiss in July 1936. This is about a year after Hiss said he got rid of Crosley. And it was consistent with Chambers' story of a long, personal, close friendship and not with uh, the short, unpleasant business relationship Hiss alleged. And when he was confronted with all this, sim Hiss simply professed ignorance. He said, how did I no longer know this guy in 1935, but he knows I signed a car over in 1936? Well, maybe I gave Crosley the car in 35, and a year later, I was at the office in the Justice Department, hard at work on a brief for the Supreme Court, and someone ducked into my office and said, Mr. Hiss, there's a man in the hallway who says that you something about a car a year ago, and here's some paperwork to sign. And I signed it, and the whole thing was over in 30 seconds, and I've totally forgotten about it. I'm not saying that happened, but it could have happened that way. Uh, Hiss got so vague that the audience laughed at him repeatedly, and even his own supporters in the audience shook their heads. 
When Hiss said, I had no way of knowing Chambers was a communist, he was sort of hoist on his own petard because he'd already begun what, he, what was called the defensive reputation. You know, look at all the presidents and Supreme Court justices and people who have trusted me. How could they have failed to notice if I were a communist? Well, if you couldn't tell whether Crosley was a communist, how are these people supposed to know whether you're one? Congressman A. Bear later said that Hiss was harder to pin down than a greased pig at a country fair. At the hearing, he could only snarl, you are a remarkable and agile young man, Mr. Hiss. And Congressman Munt said that his wife told him that he had been taken in by Mr. Hiss's suavity. HUAC did not hide its disbelief in Hiss, and perhaps unfortunately, Hiss reciprocated. When it got back to the teeth, Nixon expressed puzzlement at Hiss's emphasis on Chambers' teeth and said, didn't you ever see Mr. Crosley with his mouth closed? And Hiss answered, the striking thing in my recollection about Crosley was not when his mouth was shut, but when he, when he had his mouth open. And the audience laughed, and the chairman chided the audience for that, and then Hiss snapped, I understand the laughter to be at the question, not at the answer, Mr. Chairman. Maybe you and Mr. Nixon would like to withdraw and tell your jokes. Really burning his bridges. Maybe they're already burned, I don't know. Hiss always had a plausible explanation, or barely plausible, for every point where he was tripped up. You know, who can remember exactly what happened 13 years ago? And if I were sitting before a hostile tribunal that was looking to charge me for perjury, if I misremembered something, I might be willing to say, to the best of my recollection, 200 times. But the problem was that Hiss was tripped up on every detail, and he had to explain away all the evidence. And every new fact seemed to document the close relationship going on for longer and longer and required Hiss to change his story to make it more and more like Chambers' story had been from the start. And by the end of the questioning, Hiss was willing to commit to almost nothing. Nixon asked him, how many times in the last 15 years have you borrowed a car from a friend for the summer? And Hiss answered, I would want to search my recollection and the recollection of friends. Congressman Munt summed it up as follows. He said, even by your own records, even by your own account, Mr. Hiss, and I'm quoting, you knew this man. You knew him well. You knew him so well that you even trusted him with your apartment. You let him use your furniture. You let him use or you gave him your automobile. You think you probably took him to New York. You bought him lunches in the Senate restaurant. You had him staying in your home when it was inconvenient for him to stay in the apartment. And you made him a series of small loans. There's no doubt about that. On every point on which we've been able to verify, on which, we've had ver on which we have had verifiable evidence before us, this testimony of Mr. Chambers has stood up, but your testimony is clouded by a strangely deficient memory. Hiss was allowed to make a closing statement. He said, Chambers is a self-confessed liar, spy, and traitor. Again, Hiss equating communism with treason. He's been peddling to various government agencies for 10 years or so stories about me. He said, lots of information about me is a, is a matter of public record. Who's who says that I'm, I like bird watching? Chambers could have been studying my life for years and building up a storehouse of facts with which to simulate a friendship 10 or 15 years ago. He said, my life, on the other hand, is an open book. I've worked with judges, ambassadors, cabinet members, and presidents. It's inconceivable that there could have been on my part during 15 years or more of public service any departure from the highest rectitude without it being known. And Hiss said, and he spoke the truth here, this hearing really isn't about me. He said, it's about the New Deal and the Roosevelt Truman foreign policy. It is an attempt, and I'm quoting, to discredit recent great achievements of this country in which I was privileged to contribute, the finest and deepest American traditions, I, too, have had a not insignificant role in the magnificent achievements of our nation in recent times. And who is this man who now calls himself Chambers? Is he a man of consistent reliability, truthfulness, and honor? Indeed, is he a man of sanity? His career is not, like those of normal men, an open book. My action in being kind to Crosley years ago was one of humaneness, with results which surely some members of the committee have experienced. You do a favor for a man, he comes for another, he gets a third favor from you. When you finally realize he's an inveterate repeater, you get rid of him. If your loss is only a loss of time and money, you're lucky. You may find yourself calumniated in a degree depending on whether the man is unbalanced or worse. He said you should ask Mr. Chambers for a complete biography of all his writing 
under any and every name he has used. I would like him to be asked if he's ever been treated for mental illness. When Nixon asked Hiss if he had any reason to believe that Chambers had been treated for mental illness, Hiss said only that he had heard rumors to that effect. So, and do you find Hiss credible? Somewhat sympathetic? Well, then it was Chambers' turn. He testified and was questioned for about two hours. Hiss took notes a lot while Chambers was testifying. He said he'd never been treated for mental illness, period. His testimony was strikingly simple and forthright, at least when he st stuck to the facts. There was no, to, to, to the best of my recollections. He said he had, his no he had known Hiss through 1938, had stayed at numerous Hiss homes numerous times. He said Mr. Hiss considered it a, a privilege to have a superior in the communist organization in his home and that he had collected party dues from him. Congressman A. Bear asked him, now Mr. Chambers, you've heard Mr. Hiss on the stand today all day long. What is your reaction to his denials? And he said, Mr. Hiss is lying. I would say that it's a, at least 80% fabrication. He said, I was very fond of Mr. Hiss, perhaps my closest friend. And towards the end of his examination, UX Chairman Thomas asked Chambers, in effect, we're used to seeing communists here at HUAC who are black people or foreigners or Jews or labor union members or poor people. Or people have had a hard time in this country, and you can imagine them wanting to, you know, tear the whole thing and down and start all over again. But in these hearings, for the first time, we've seen people like you and Mr. Hiss, who were native-born Americans and whites and Christians and good families and great educations and people who can command a good salary. How do people like you become communists? And Chambers answered as follows. The making of a good living does not necessarily blind a man to a critical period in which he's passing through. Such people, in fact, may feel a special insecurity and anxiety. They seek a moral solution in a world of moral confusion. Marxism-Leninism offers an oversimplified explanation of the causes and a program for action. The very vigor of the project appeals particularly to the more or less sheltered middle class intellectuals who feel that there the whole context of their lives has kept them away from the world of reality. I do not know whether I make this very clear, but I'm trying to get at it. They feel a very natural concern, one might almost say a Christian concern, for underprivileged people. They feel a great intellectual concern, at least, for recurring economic crises, the problem of war, which in our lifetime has attained such an atrocious proportion, which always weighs on them. What shall I do? At that crossroads, the evil thing, communism, lies in waiting for a simple answer. And then Nixon asked Chambers, do you, is there any grudge that you have against Mr. Hiss over anything he's done to you? Chambers gave an answer that still gives some people goosebumps. One newspaper wrote that his voice slowed close to choking. Another said that his eyes were brimming with tears. Chambers said, the story has spread that in testifying against Mr. Hiss, I am working out some old grudge or motives of revenge or hatred. I do not hate Mr. Hiss. We were close friends. But we are caught in a tragedy of history. Mr. Hiss represents the concealed enemy which we are all fighting and I am fighting. I have testified against him with remorse and pity, but in a moment of history in which this nation now stands, so help me, I could not do otherwise. And Chambers bowed his head, he was, couldn't say a word more, and sitting about 10 feet away, Alger Hiss looks up and shakes his head as if to say, into the hands of what nutcase, what psycho have I fallen? Why me, Lord, why me? And that's how the hearings ended, at about 8 in the evening. I'd say that Hiss's credibility about his story of his limited friendship with Chambers was badly damaged. Uh, Chambers came across as weird, but supported by all this circumstantial evidence. But, on the, but this was all about the nature of the friendship, and on the crucial question of whether Hiss had been a secret communist was still one man's word against the other. And that's where the whole scandal might have died, and Hiss and Chambers might have returned to their well-paying jobs in New York City, and life would have gone on. But that's not the way fate ordained it. Um, First, a few days after the Marathon HUAC hearing, one more bit of light was shed on the relationship in the 30s by a 
now defunct tabloid newspaper in Baltimore, the Baltimore News Post. This newspaper revealed that in April 36, Hiss had signed a contract to buy a farm in Carroll County, Maryland, and paid a security deposit on it. The deal fell through in May, however, and Hiss never bought the farm. Nine months later, in early 1937, Mrs. Chambers bought the same farm. This was not the farm they were living on in 1948, by the way. And when all this was told to Chambers, he said, oh, now it's all coming back to me. I remember Hiss and I used to say, wouldn't it be nice to have a little place in the country you could go on the weekends? And we visited it in the Model A Ford in 1936, but Mrs. Hiss didn't like the place. She said it was in a nasty, narrow valley. And Chambers' recollection was supported by lots of letters and the files of realtors, um, and I think in the records of the Carroll County Recorder of Deeds Office, too. So the question is, how did Chambers come to see and buy the same obscure parcel of land that Hiss in, in rural Maryland, miles away from where either of them lived, that Hiss had almost bought a year earlier? Either there was a coincidence so great as to be incredible, or he or Chambers and Hiss were on cordial terms in mid-1936. That's a year after Hiss said, I got the deadbeat out of my life. One other thing, uh, Hiss got in one more statement on the case. He sent HUAC a long letter with a recitation of famous names of people I've known, innocence by association, Nixon called it. And um, Hiss's letter struck less, struck less subtly at a theme he'd hinted at before, that there was something funny about Chambers. Four times in a 14-page letter, Hiss used the, state, the term somewhat queer to describe Chambers' story, as in, I find Mr. Chambers' accusations to be somewhat queer. So, you're Hiss and Chambers, what do you do? You, either of them could have just gone back to work and gone on with life, but Alger Hiss did not do that.